I'm going to read to you for a little bit uh, a couple of different sections from the book, but uh, I just wanted to start off really quickly by uh, also saying thank you, especially thank you, Leah, for that beautiful introduction um, and uh, for summarizing the book in a way that I really always struggle to figure out how to describe this book to people, and, and I should just really carry that around in my pocket and read it to people. Um, and uh, I also want to thank uh, Chris in particular, uh, an old friend and a good friend, and uh, everybody else here at uh, the Center for Fiction for hosting this event. Um, if anybody here isn't familiar with the Center for Fiction, um, you should really check out all the stuff that they've got to offer. Um, they do great work uh, supporting the cause of uh, fiction, and, uh, and especially for young writers like myself. Uh, I worked in the writer's studio up on the top floor one winter for a month or uh, for a month or so, not on this book, but on another book, um, which uh, didn't didn't survive. But that wasn't the same. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, um, and uh, I wanted to also just take a a quick second before I start reading to thank, uh, of course, uh, Maggie and Chelsea and my family and everybody else that's here. Uh, Maggie, my editor, Chelsea, my agent. Um, and, uh, and then uh, all of you, met so many of you, people that I've known, uh, friends of mine who've been patiently kind of holding my hand for the last uh, 18 plus months or even longer than that while we, you know, sort of wait, uh, waited for this moment. Um, and, uh, and I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot in the last few weeks about sort of what's the best part of finally getting to this place. and. Uh, and I realized that I think the coolest part about it is, uh, is now the book is actually starting to get out there and people are reading it and starting to hear some of the responses that I've gotten from people. Um, and I wanted to share one with you guys, if you don't mind, uh, really quickly that I got uh, recently from a reader. Uh, I knew I was going to like this review. This is just from sort of a, uh, someone online here. Uh, I knew I was going to like this review because it started with... Um, I got this book in my mail a few days ago, tossed it on my bed. Later, after a housewarming party, I came in and started reading it. Even though I, it was late and I was kind of drunk, it wrapped me up right away. <laughs> I thought that was a good start. Um, but uh, after going on to talk about the novel a little bit, um, she sort of wraps up the review by saying something that I think, if I could hear this from you know a writer once a year, would, a reader, sorry, once a year, it would be great. Um, she says, uh, there's a scene at the Grand Canyon, uh, and the narrator says something about how, out of all the wonders of the world, this is the only one that lives up to the hype. I only live a few hours from the Grand Canyon, and I've never seen it. I live right next to other beautiful places I ignore, and I live in a huge city full of people who are as interesting as people anywhere, but I don't even try to find them. I just keep waiting until I can go to France or whatever, which I'm not even sure I can ever do. So I booked a weekend trip to Sedona because I've never been there either, and I'm bringing this book with me to read again. I don't know if this is a permanent change or just me feeling restless from reading so much about other places, but either way, it's because the book made me want to do something different with myself, and that's more than I could have hoped for. Um, I sent her a note back saying that was like the sweetest thing anybody could possibly say. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I managed to choke myself up there a little bit. Um, okay. So I'm going to read to you guys uh, a little bit here from the beginning of the book first, and then uh, if there's time, I'll read a little bit from the second half of the book. Um, the first chapter here um, starts off, uh, it's, it's, it's right from the first chapter, but just to set it up a little bit, uh, I chose this because uh, the name of the first chapter is The Debutante. Uh, and uh, this is my debut novel, so I sort of thought it would be it would be fitting. Uh, this is kind of my coming out to the impolite society of literature, so, um, so I thought we'd start with this. Um, the narrator in the story has um, sort of ended up. Um, uh, he works. He's about 16 years old here, and he works at a cafe and an art museum in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, and the setup here is that uh, Billy Little Littleford is sort of the local hometown hero uh, who plays golf with the narrator uh, on, the, on the high school golf team. Um, he's been gravely injured by, uh, in, a, in an accident. Uh, his friend Mark hits him in the head with a golf club and he's in the hospital. Uh, and so the narrator has sort of you know, been asked to play Cinderella here uh, and sub in for him at, uh, at his sister Betsy Littleford, Littleford's uh, uh, debutante ball that night. Um, and I'll start, uh, I'll start with that. Whoa. Okay. 20 minutes later, when I saw my reflection in the inside of the elevator doors, I did not even recognize myself. Billy's tuxedo was a little long in the sleeve, but I looked all right. I thought that surely I could impersonate a proper member of the leisure class for two hours. But when the doors parted and I saw Betsy Littleford standing there, my confidence withered like grass in winter. The voluminous lower folds of her white dress flowed from the waist like collapsing waves, descending from where the defined V of its northern border intercepted an orbit of tiny pearls. 
Her hair was down, covering her bare shoulders. A second V was formed by the neat crossing of her gloved hands. A third and final V came in the shape of her shaped, sharply plunging eyebrows. Already, I'd done something wrong. Come on, she said, grabbing my hand and jerking me towards the ballroom's arched doorway. They started going in four minutes ago. Red velvet curtains covered the high windows that normally illuminated the rotunda. Tall Roman columns supported a great glass dome through which the moon could be seen full and yellow and high above us. Briefly, I felt as though I was being led into the Colosseum to be fed to the lions. The room swarmed with older women in scarves and slinky evening gowns and distinguished men in finely tailored tuxedos. The debutantes were there, perhaps 20 girls, in full regalia, white gloves, floor-length floor dresses, and pearls that had belonged to their mother's mothers. They stood in a line, arm in arm, with fathers or brothers. The only guy I recognized was Mark from the golf team, who was escorting Suzanne and looking more than a little pale. A man at a podium called the girls' names aloud one at a time, and with each presentation, he announced the name of her escort. Each girl then stepped into a spotlight, curtsied politely, and smiled. Next, she took her escort by the hand and moved on to allow the next young pair to take its place. Betsy's face remained in total lockdown, but I wondered if I would finally see her smile tonight. Sorry about your brother, I whispered weakly. Betsy's face did not change even slightly. Her eyes stared off at nothing at all. Soon a harried little man rushed over to us with Mrs. Litterford in tow. He's right here, I told you, Mrs. Litterford said. Just have Mr. Isherwood say, presenting Elizabeth Litterford, escorted by... Mrs. Litterford looked blankly at me. She did not know my name. He is an old friend of Billy's. This is... And again, she trailed off. Betsy's crisp, uh, crescent lips began to form my name, but before she could speak it, I blurted out another name instead. Walter, I lied, thinking of the detective in my Wilkie Collins, Wilkie Collins book. Walter Hartwright. Betsy's eyes bulged ever so slightly, and her lips eased gently back into place. There was no smile and no laugh, just an odd blankness. She wasn't angry, that much I could see. She was amused, I was sure, only rather than smile, she somehow unsmiled. Then I saw it at last. Betsy's smile was the absence of smiling. As the man ran off to give the speaker my fake name, Betsy pushed her mother's hand aside and said, Walter, when did you and Beth Billy become such good friends? Uh, acting class in fifth grade, I lied. Uh, Billy was Vladimir in our production of Waiting for Godot, and I was Estragon. <laughs> it worked. Betsy unsmiled again. Her mother seemed puzzled, but Betsy stepped in suddenly. You were in Switzerland with Grandma. And before Mrs. Littleford could question this, the couple ahead of us stepped away, and Betsy dragged me into the light. The audience assumed a solemn silence. May I present Miss Elizabeth Littleford, Mr. Isherwood said, escorted by a close friend of her brother's, Mr. Walter Hartwright. The applause was sudden and electrifying. Betsy curtsied elegantly, but did not smile, not even a little. She took my hand in her gloved one and led me out of the light. After a hundred hands had been shaken and a hundred platitudes exchanged, Betsy drew me to a table where we sat side by side in front of gold inlaid plates and silently consumed Niswa salads and Wagyu steaks while the adults talked of Morningstar ratings, Croatian catamaran chartering, and hunting tundra swans. I watched Betsy closely out of the corner of my eye, making sure I lifted the same utensils when she did. To my fascination, I found this new role was an easier fit than I'd expected. It seemed that no one really expected much from the escorts anyway. While the girls had gotten a full year of debutante training, the boys seemed to be winging it. I did a damn sight better than Mark, for instance, who sat across from me, using only one fork and dribbling sauce conspicuously down his shirt front. <laughs> he acknowledged my existence but once, when Mrs. Littleford asked me to tell everyone about Bill Billy's early acting career and addressed me as Walter. <laughs> Suzanne firmly squeezed Mark's hand as he began to correct her, and then he winced in confusion. Before dessert was even served, Mark had vanished to the men's room three times, returning slightly drunker after each visit. I didn't blame him. The conversation kept spiraling back to Billy no matter how much Mrs. Littleford and the others tried to avoid the subject. Early decision notices will come soon, Suzanne's mother said. Walter, where have you applied? Princeton, I answered quickly. Everyone smiled except Betsy, who unsmiled. Walter's bright future at Princeton grew to involve a position on the golf team and an old friend who promised to take me sailing on the, Del on the Delaware. Then, of course, there'd be writing classes with prize-winning authors. The mothers all approved. I was so engrossed in it all that it wasn't until my water glass was being refilled for the third time that I recognized Rodrigo, my co-worker, holding the uh, Waterford pitcher, wearing a staff uniform. Mr. Hartwright, he asked, smirking somewhat, may I refresh your glass? I shifted down in my seat as he poured. 
Suddenly I felt sure that everybody knew I was full of it, that clearly none of these rich people believed that I was really some well-to-do son of a paper manufacturer, just as they didn't believe that Mark was in any way sober, or that Betsy Littleford's father was really away on business, or that her brother was sure to recover in a few weeks. Time for the waltz, Betsy said, suddenly removing her napkin from her lap. Waltz? Like the, the waltz? Waltz? I mumbled, struggling to stand on my suddenly shaky legs. Rodrigo was trying to help Suzanne get Mark to his feet, and no one was looking at us. I leaned in as close as I dared. I don't know how. The boys are all disasters. Just try to look like you're leading. So we stepped out onto the dance floor with the others, and the girls prodded their partners so as to form a wide circle. The stiff-looking Mr. Isherwood made some sort of announcement regarding the sponsored charity, and then there was a crash of music, and Betsy beckoned with her right hand for me to extend my left. I did so, shifting all my weight onto my right foot as she took it. She then drew herself in against me, slightly to my right, so that just half of her pressed up against just half of me. I half passed out. <laughs> Betsy guided my right hand to the smooth skin below her shoulder blade and placed her right hand into my left and held it out high opposite my neck. Then, through what I can only assume was girl sorcery, she began to move her feet in such a way that my feet knew just where to go. One, two, three, she whispered into my ear, forward, side, together. And we began to revolve around the floor like a clock's hands in reverse, spinning around our own axis like the two sides of one moon. I had no idea you were an actor, she said. How unexpected. Oh, no, I just made all that up, I said quickly, about me and Billy. Exactly, she said, very funny. But her amusement was silent, just between us. It's very hard to tell with you, I said. I smiled. She didn't. We waltzed. <laughs> Did you know, she said dryly, that the waltz was originally a peasant dance and that Viennese nobles initially were shocked by the indecency of dancing so closely? I did not know that. You should try taking debutante classes for a year, and I'll peek out of a kitchen window and watch you every Sunday. Before I could decide if she was joking or upset, the song came to its end and she began to pull away from me. Thanks for filling in, Walter. The mo mothers were all on their feet as we came back to the table. Mark, somewhat dizzier for all the waltzing, was vo now vomiting semi-raw tuna and well-massaged cow meat all over the table, along with about a quart of Jack Daniels. He's hardly slept since Billy's accident, Mrs. White apologized, before the flow had even ceased. It wasn't your fault, dear. Understandably, the whole incident had put everybody off, and Mrs. Littleford, sensing that the evening would only go downhill from here, tapped Betsy on the hand and said, Come, dear. Visiting hours will be over at 10. We're expected back. Walter and I need to go say goodbye to the Von Porters, Betsy said, her face showing nothing, no resignation, no urgency. So, I said, thinking, so that was it then, as we walked away in the direction of the Von Porters. But as soon as she had escaped her mother's sight, Betsy began to move quickly towards a set of double doors that led into the sculpture garden. Before I knew it, we were outside. Thick clouds had moved in from the south, covering the full moon like a wash of ink. We spent the whole morning at the hospital, she complained. How's he doing? Not too good, she said. He's got this big hole in the side of his head. Oh, I said, a little surprised by her even tone. Was she mad at me? Did she think that I had been somehow indirectly responsible for Billy's current state? That was a joke, she explained, her blue eyes dancing like fireflies in the dark. Sure, I said. Mystified, I continued to follow her down the gravel paths of the sculpture garden. Want to hear something else funny? We stepped gingerly over little artificial streams, jumping from rock to rock with our shoes in our hands like children. Well, something that I think is very funny. All right, I said. He woke up while I was there this morning. He had this breathing tube in, so he couldn't speak until they pulled it out. And then his mouth was real dry, but he kept trying to say something. He pulled me in real close because he can hardly even whisper. And you'll never guess what he said. What? I asked. He goes, who are you? He didn't know who I was. So I say, I'm Betsy, your sister. And he goes, Betsy, I'm gay. I'm gay, Betsy, I'm gay. I nearly <laughs> slipped off the rocks and into the water. What did you say, I asked. I said, yeah, I know, Billy, I know. Like I didn't see him making out with our neighbor, neighbor Roger when we were in the eighth grade, but he couldn't remember. Jesus, I mumbled. Betsy went on. He didn't remember who I was, but he remembered that. And my mother's standing there bawling, pretending she didn't hear what he said. And I'm standing there thinking, huh, he finally comes out on the day of my coming out. <laughs> and there it was, another distinct unlaugh. And then, still barefoot, Betsy began to run across a long green field, empty except for us. I was surprised at how fast she was able to run in her gown. 
I could not see the museum at all anymore, just neat curves of trees along the sloping grass. Betsy kept on running. Not until we came to the top of the hill and I saw a little oasis of sand in the distance did I realize we'd come to the Briar Creek Golf Course. She slowed down at last as we crossed onto the eighth hole. She sat down on the edge of the bunker. So this is where it happened, she asked. I guess so, I said. The spot where Billy had fallen had been smoothed out in, into a neat spiral. Not a single bloody grain of sand remained evident in the trap. Nervous, I took my hand and pressed it on top of hers. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't, it didn't seem as if there could be anything worth saying. You don't seem that upset, I said finally. It's all just so, she began and then stopped. Unexpected. Of course. No, I, I mean, my family, we, well, they, see to it that nothing unexpected ever happens. No grade lower than an A minus. No winter we don't spend in Colorado. No summer we don't go to the Outer Banks. My mother will host the Spring Leukemia Fundraiser. My father will say he'll be home for our birthdays. Only something will come up and he'll send a savings bond instead. That's awful, I said. It's not. It's just expected. How can it be awful if it's expected? I guess. Two days ago, Billy was going to Chapel Hill like my father, and then Wharton, Stern, or Harvard, and then take over my father's company someday. Everyone sitting in that ballroom knows that was the plan, just like they all know that I was going to go to a liberal arts college and read some Emily Dickinson and talk about slants of light and join Alpha Gamma Pi and then get a degree I'd never use because I'd be married to an econ major I met my first semester. <laughs> then while he'd be at business school, Wharton, Stern, or Harvard, I'd start popping out babies and choosing window treatments, the expected treatments, the expected babies. She looked up at the wide black sky. But now, I asked, now Billy's not going to be the next Littleford to go to Chapel Hill. He'll be lucky if he can go to the bathroom. He's not going to go to Wharton or run the company. He can't count to ten. It's terrible, I said. It is terrible, she agreed. So now you'll go to Chapel Hill and Wharton and run the company. Is that what you mean? I don't know, she said. I'm going to do, she turned her head to look at me, whatever I want. She relished each syllable. The corners of her lips were just barely curling. Then she lay her head down on my shoulder. Billy told me you sneak out here at night to practice. Face turning a deep red, I asked, how did he know that? She shrugged, you're the best player on the team and the only one whose dad doesn't drag him out here every Saturday. Billy's not an idiot. Well, he wasn't an idiot. Is that another joke? <laughs> Walter, what kind of monster do you take me for? She said, batting her eyelashes. I had to, do, I had to ask, how come you never smile? Smile. She repeated my word flatly. That's what they told me in every debutante class for a year of Sundays. Smile, Betsy, smile. It's your job to put everyone else at ease. Make them feel welcome. She shrugged, her bare shoulder nudging into mine. My dad's been on a business trip in Dubai since I was 10. My mom's miserable. My brother's gay and now brain damaged to boot. Put yourself at ease. Make yourself feel welcome. I'll smile when there's something worth smiling about. <coughs> Fair enough, I said, trying hard not to laugh. Billy liked you, she said after a minute. I mean, likes you. I mean, if he remembers who you are anymore, he probably still likes you. <laughs> I, think, I think of all the guys he knew, Billy would have wanted me to go, uh, to go with you tonight. She studied me for a moment, and it seemed as though she were about to kiss me, or possibly devour me. It turns out I was right on both counts. First she kissed me, and then came the devouring of any hope I ever had of forgetting her, or that night, or Billy, or any of it. So that's the end of the book. guys up for just a little more? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I wanted to read just two sections because the first half of the book and the second half are a little different, uh, both in tone and in a lot of different ways. Um, so uh, the second half of the book, uh, this, this next section I'm going to read you guys comes from a much later chapter. Um, this is now 18 years later, about halfway around the world. Um, the narrator's uh, sort of early ambitions to become a writer have sort of soured. Uh, a good friend of his, uh, Jeffrey Oakes, uh, has, uh, uh, has become a, 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 an international best-selling author, uh, and, uh, and uh, he has not, uh, and so he's not very happy about it. Um, and, uh, and so these sort of, uh, I think in this chapter is sort of maybe where he hits rock bottom, for, uh, and, uh, uh, and in the form of uh, deciding that he's going to um, try to make his, his dreams of being a writer come true um, by writing a sort of tell-all biography of his friend, Jeffrey. Um, so I'll just read you a little bit here. 
Jeffrey Oakes, author of The Luminous Nothing Sacred, has made no media appearances, given not a single interview, even to Oprah, and has accepted not a single prize or honor in nine years, though he's won several. For those somehow unfamiliar, Nothing Sacred had the rare quality of seeming like a classic on the day it was first printed, with a clever consortium of low-lying postmodern puzzles to occupy the highbrow and heartfelt hijinks to captivate the, low, uh, to captivate the lowbrow. It is the rare sort of book that resembles nothing else, and yet seems somehow intensely familiar. From the first line, you feel your own heartbeat begin to beat differently. Once it's over, you want to begin it again. It is a love letter. It is an atom bomb. It is literature we've forgotten could be written. Only now, after eight years with no follow-up, eager critics have begun to claim that Jeffrey's relentless dedication to his art must have pushed him over the brink, that the pressure to measure up to nothing sacred has undone its creator. Certain loyal factions speculate that he is actually hiding away, only to create more of a frenzy about his next novel. If he is, it certainly appears to be working. The latte shop gossip rages on. Some believe Oakes is merely doing research and that he is furiously crafting his next masterpiece in a padded room somewhere. Others believe that it is all a stunt. Some believe that he's gone full Salinger, that he will never resurface, not even if they give him the Booker Prize for his next book, which almost everyone agrees was a crime that he did not win last time, despite the fact that he has not lived in England for nearly 25 years, and though he was born there, even his parents have now officially relocated to France. I wonder if I'll dash his chances when I verify, in the 10th chapter of his biography, that he once flung his EU passport into the Hudson to protest the cancellation of his favorite BBC children's television program. Still, each month, Nothing Sacred remains on bestseller lists and the flames are fueled further. This is why my editor has brought me here to the Gold Coast, to the white man's grave, to the least failed state in Africa, the Republic of Ghana, where the oldest of the Oaks still resides. Jeremiah Oaks, Jeffrey's beloved grandfather, lives 30 miles outside Kumasi, near the sacred lake Gusumtwi, where Jeffrey spent his childhood summers playing around in the catacomb of Ghanaian gold mines, which had been in his family's possession since colonial days. Now the mines are run by the KMS Mining Corporation, and Jeremiah Oakes remains only because he refuses to go. He has lived in Africa nearly all his life, and I imagine he'd prefer to die there than leave. As Jeffrey's first exposure to the literary dimensions, the old man is all I need to fill in the last remaining sections of my illuminating biography, for which the world waits impatiently. This has unfortunately proved more difficult than I anticipated. As I come up the long driveway to the Oaks Mines and Estate, my driver, Kojo, swings his rust, swerves his rusty Hyundai to avoid an incoming rifle shot. A hundred yards away, on his sagging porch, Jeremiah Oakes wobbles from the blowback of his ancient firearm. Fortunately, he is almost as blind as he is senile. Before he can regain his footing and reload the rifle, I am out of the car, rushing at him with, the yam, with yams raised. Uh, he's bought him some yams. So <laughs> uh, it's me, I shout, as the dust from the car settles. From somewhere around the house, his two housekeepers, Efua and Ecuba, come running. When they see it as I, they are only slightly less annoyed. They glare at me as they call out to Kojo in Sing Song Tree. All three speak English quite well. They converse in Tree only when I am around, if they don't want me to know that, I think, that they think that I am a liar and a thief, which I am. Jeffrey, shouts the old man, come on inside, I've been traveling, there's so much I need to show you. The old man has no more been traveling than I am his grandson, but I do not dissuade him of either delusion. Lowering my yams, I once more trudge up to the creaking steps that lead into the crumbling house of oaks. Inside, the air is full of flies, and Jeremiah leads the, the way back to the room he calls his study, a room where he wrote six or seven novels back in the late 70s, none of which are still in print. I have tracked them all down and read them all cover to cover. They remind me a bit of my own efforts. Not bad, but not Jeffrey. A gigantic fan revolves lazily around our heads, sending just enough cool air down to bristle the photographs and scraps of newspaper he has pinned on every walled surface. Old illustrations from books of World War II submarines, articles in Spanish about boys killed during the running of the bulls, and tattered letters written, handwritten in Hebrew. On a long, narrow desk sits a typewriter, the same faint ink thing that Jeffrey typed his first stories on, and beside it, thin bundles of monogrammed paper stolen from hotels worldwide some of which haven't existed since the 1950s. There are guns everywhere, some antique showpieces and some roadshow side finds, some loaded, some not. The floor is covered with skins, a warthog, a zebra, a lioness, and an antelope, most of which, according to Jeremiah, escaped from the preserve next door and came waltzing right in through the wide set of French doors, which he leaves open day or night to the terrace outside. The jungle is 100 yards away. 
Checking my watch as if I have somewhere else to be, I say, so I think we're nearly done. I'd love to ask if you have any other memories of teaching me to write here when I was young. He settles into a leather reading chair and lifts a glass of something dirty, brown, and surely intoxicating off a stack of books piled to serve at a side table as a side table. Oh, sure, sure, he says. You used to sit right here in this chair and write every morning. That's how you make progress. Every morning, you write. Even if your leg is being chewed off by a hyena, you, you keep writing. How old was I when I first came to visit? Oh, maybe about 22, he says, staring at the ceiling fan as it drowsily completes a revolution. Wasn't I maybe six or seven? Oh yeah, six or seven. And you'd sit right over there, banging away on the keys. So I sat there at the desk. Yes, that's right. Because a minute ago you said I would be in the chair. The old man frowned. Well, sometimes we do it that way. Whipping out my nib, nib pen, I add this note to my calfskin book, along with hundreds of other similar contradictory statements. The truth is, Jeremiah says something different every time we speak. My notebook is a garden of forking paths. Jeffrey came to Ghana because of early childhood asthma, or because his great aunt became ill. Jeffrey's favorite childhood book was Moby Dick, and the next hour it was the Iliad. His first book or fiction was about an ogre named Claude, unless it was about a Swiss chocolatier named PJ. One day, certainly the former, and the next, certainly the latter. The man is in his 80s, and his brain is worn through like a shirt glove too well. When his daughter calls to make sure everything is well, he tells them, Jeffrey's here talking with me, and they don't even question it. You mentioned yesterday that I wanted to be a librarian as a child. I lie, just to see if he'll notice. He furrows his na narrow brow, which is speckled with brown spots that I'm sure must be melanomas. Will he remember that he actually told me that Jeffrey wanted to be a scuba diver? The spots swim in the fleshy wrinkles for a moment and then flatten again. He laughs. You like the idea of climbing all those ladders, I think. You said we want to be a librarian only if they had really tall bookshelves and ladders with wheels. The fictions that Jeremiah sparked like furious flints in his neurons for decades have now caught fire and consumed the remainder of his truth. Does he really believe these things, or does he fill in the blanks with his best guesses and hope that he's right? Most times he'll run with whatever I suggest, like a freshman writing student eagerly jumping into a story after being given an opening line as a prompt. With a long stare, I stare, uh, a sigh, I stare out into the darkened jungle. Uh, Tina is right, if anything, Jeremiah is a plagiarist's wet dream. I can put words into his mouth and he'll never remember they weren't there to begin with. All day I feed him fictions and listen to him echo them back as truths. But still, this hollow feeling grows. Do you have any of my early stories, I ask, as I do every day? No, he says firmly, definitely not. It is the only answer he gives the same each time, so I'm sure it is a lie. Jeremiah takes out a knife and expertly plunges it deep into one of the yams I've given him. He works the blade through the flesh and div divides it neatly in two. He stares inside of it with a childlike curiosity. I wonder if he knows that you cannot eat them raw. I wonder if I would stop him. I think that I would. <laughs> Looking back at the gentle undulations of the, palm, of the palm fronds, I exhale and try to think of how I could get a look around without his stopping me. Occasionally he naps or uses the restroom and I sneak in and dig around, but I've yet to find anything of use. There's only one drawer in the desk that he keeps locked. If I'm ever going to get it open, I'll need to buy myself more time. Then, out on the edge of the jungle, I see something moving. Jeremiah sees it too, and he points, the knife outstretched. What is that? I ask, straining my young eyes in the glare of the light. Is that Jeffrey? He asks with a laugh. What's he doing out there? Blinking twice to make sure it is no mirage, I look again. But there I am, creeping through the low-lying brush. My doppelganger has ditched the tweed jacket, as I have. The heat is too, simply too intense. His silver wristwatch glints in the light. What's Jeffrey doing out there? He asks again. Suddenly, I wonder if it is Jeffrey, the real Jeffrey, and my heart leaps into my throat. But it can't be. Jeffrey would sooner roll around in his own feces than crouch and scrub brush. My double is perhaps a hundred yards away, and he ducks out of sight. When I turn back to Jeremiah, he is standing with his knife pointing at me. If that's Jeffrey, then who the hell are you? I'll stop there, and you guys have to read it. <laughs>